all right guys i just uh, uh just lovely to have you back um i just want to make you aware of a few things uh first thing is that generally on the 27th of nisan is yom hashua which is the holocaust memorial day but in certain days in the gregorian calendar it moves back like for example if the 27th of nisan falls on a friday like it does this year it falls back technically to the 26th of Nisan during the day, Yom Ashua. And for example, if the 27th of Nisan falls on a Sunday, to avoid it being adjacent with uh, Shabbat, uh, it, it alters there as well. Are you, are, are you with me? So in other words, if it, uh, it, it alters according to the Gregorian calendar, how it affects Shabbat on certain days. But generally, it's not on the 26th of Nisan, which is uh, which is the Hebrew day tomorrow. It's on the twenty seventh. Except if Shabbat is affected, it's either pushed forward or pushed back. Just so you know, I don't know if you guys. Uh, I don't know if you guys were aware of that. Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't aware of it, but it makes sense. Okay, you so, obviously know when something like that associated with uh, it's supposed to be a happy day. No, well, also they want Shabbos, the, they want they want to have it on Shabbos. They don't, they don't want to have it on Shabbos, Shabbos that's because. That's uh, you have to blow sirens and there are a myriad of halakhic effects. I mean, this was passed in the Knesset yes. on the 8th of April 1959. And when it was passed, there were a lot more from people in the Knesset. Um, so um, base, basically, they took Shabbos into account. I don't know if they take it into account these days, but anyway, thank God they did. All right. So on the 26th of Nisan, I've got I've got a yacht It's not my grandmother, which makes sense actually, because it hasn't been a year since we've done the Gomorrah Shear. Uh, um, it's it's actually my late grandfather, which Arthur I think did know. Yes, funny yes. enough, I'm just going to share the screen. Uh, a second. Yes, you Thank you, Steve. Thanks, mate. Um, just going to share my screen. Yeah, my grandfather last week's in seven day pesa. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so guys, just want to just tell you a little bit about uh, my grandfather. He's on the left, obviously. My grandmother's on the right. They've got genetically a good-looking couple. I don't know what happened to me, but what yes. <laughs> it is. What it it's is. a generation every now and again. Yeah, or two. <laughs> um, but uh, so that was my mom's parents. So obviously, Basil Berman. Uh, our name is Pop Basil. I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of the man for a minute. And then we'll go straight into uh, some learning in the Gomorrah Shir. Firstly, uh, my grandfather died uh, in 2006, and he was 80. Uh, he was 84. Okay, he worked one. He worked until one week before his uh, death birthday. Yes. He was 84 uh, when he worked, and he retired one sure. week exactly prior to passing away. He had a great work ethic. He worked for Selborne Carpets, and my grandfather uh, wanted to work and keep active and keep busy. I remember he had a bench uh, press gym. I don't know if you remember, uh, Arthur, at the house in uh, Dunlop yeah. Street. And my grandfather, even in his 80s, used to do life bench pressing. He used to, he was a firm believer in physical fitness and gym, and he owned a gym in Dornfontein. And um, he wasn't scared of taking risks. He was married five times. Guy lived life to the oh. full. Wasn't scared of anything. Sure. And he wasn't Jeez. scared of commitment. Most people, you know, they, they say after 16 years, they bend down on one knee and they say, will you marry me? You know, that's how risk adverse we are. <laughs> if he liked something, <laughs> he married him. He didn't mess around. Yeah. He married my oh, grandmother. Sure. He married my oh. grandmother twice. Okay. Twice. Same woman cool. twice. He had a huge amount of... Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, warmth, uh, and and he had a really really warm countenance. Never spoke bad. He never raised his voice. Worked hard, and and uh, was totally totally, um, you know, in control of his emotional state in the sense that he never lost his cool. And when he did pass away, incidentally, the irony was. He, uh, he drank uh, peroxide instead of diet Sprite by accident, and he got sick, and he passed away and died within a day. So the doctor, Dr. Um, 
uh, Dr. Goldberg, Sharon Goldberg, turned around and said when they did the post-autopsy scan, he was riddled with pancreatic cancer, which would have been excessively agonizing. So obviously, Hashem paid attention to him to take him out of the world without agony and pain through a, uh, through a very quick event instead of suffering for close to a year with pancreatic cancer. So obviously, if Hashem does miracles for somebody, even if they're not religious or they agnostic, etc. They must be doing something uh, right. So mm. I just want to share um, uh, one. I think what it's from, James. I think what it's from is Hashem knew you'd be coming to the world and running into your rim. So it says, you know what? Let's mm. pay back with your, with your grandfather. Sam, that's uh, that's sweet, but uh, uh, he he's a much uh, he's much more he has a much more pleasant countenance than me. I've got red hair. <laughs> sometimes I lose my temper. Sometimes I'm okay. I'm so what a miracle, really. Exactly. So in Pikei Avot, guys, in chapter 1, verse 15, it says, greet everybody with a warm, cheerful face. As, uh, with, be warm, be cheerful, and with a pleasant countenance. And I think that phrase sums him up perfectly, because when we greet somebody cheerfully, we demonstrate that we're very happy to see them. And it means that we're happy that they're in this world. And that's probably one of the most precious gifts that you can give to another human being, that whether or not you're going through a huge ordeal, if you lift the spirits of others through a warm smile yeah. and you recognize and appreciate other people, then uh, th that pleases Hashem. I just wanted you to know. We're going to get straight into the Gomorrah Shira. I hope so, Damon, one quick that? question. Yeah. Selborne Carpets was on the, used to be on the East Rand. Exactly. They were customers of ours. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. can, can I just make one comment? It's quite, sure. quite interesting. Sure. Uh, your grandfather got married five times, right? Yeah. So I think Hashem, based on the fact there was this kapura five times, that's basically to deal with. <laughs> so I think Hashem said, listen, I'm, I'm not going to let you go through the bank you have been through enough. Five wives is more than enough. <laughs> and uh, he went straight to Gun Aiden. That's it. He skipped the whole, the whole thing. All right. Then, then, there's my answer. I'm going to get married five times and I got entrance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not worth it, Arthur. It's worth it to linger for a year then get married five times, trust me. Um, so just one thing, by the way, his his last wife was two years older than my mom. So the guy was a the guy was a like uh, quite a good looking guy. Can you imagine? I mean, um yeah, very, very good looking guy. He did he ran the security at Selborne Carpets. I mean, he was always into fitness, et cetera, and he made sure that nobody stole stuff. So he was tough, even at that age. Nobody, even at 83, nobody wanted to, like, you wouldn't mm. want to uh, yeah, but get cute. And, and, and your mom and your dad, both your mom and dad are good looking. I mean, your, your mom was stunning, China. She was just like, you know, and your dad was good looking. Uh, he's still good looking, even yeah. uh, even his age. Uh, yeah, so. And your well, book turned out, I don't know what skipped your generation, you, but I mean. <laughs> I'm joking, true. man. I'm it's true. Okay, man, you fight. Don't worry. Listen, you have to fight. At least, got, at least yeah. Lan got the heart, apart from the looks, you know. Um, but he got the receding hairline, which you didn't. No, he doesn't, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, mm -hmm. all right, guys, let's get let's get started quickly in the Gemara Shia because we're doing this, obviously, to elevate the Nashoma. And I, wanted, I just want to get... Uh, uh, cracking on the Gomorrah. So what uh, what happened last time is we were discussing Rav Yossi Bachanina's statement about the um, um, the carpenter and the customer and how things went tragically wrong with death and maiming. That's how we ended off last time. Um, <laughs> so happy now, note. <laughs> all right, on a ha happy note. So guys, let's let's just get seriously into it here. So we're citing a third version of Rav Yossi Bachan in a statement. We've entered the 33rd Duff. We've done 224 Shirim. And we've taken, uh, we've done each uh, Duff. Uh, there's 32 Duff. We did each of them over a seven-day period, which comes to 224. Trust me, it wasn't my precision making. It was Hashem's guidance. So we did Duff Ashavua properly. So let's, uh, let's get started. So the Gemara starts a third version of Rav Yossi Bachan in a statement. Rav Zavid, in the name of Rav, teacheth Rav Yossi's statement, 
as having been said regarding the following Bryson. The expression, and it finds, excludes a case in which the victim is one who makes himself found. In, in other words, one who moves himself in the path of the projectile after it has been released from the thrower. So at the meantime, because your head hasn't been in the Gomorrah for two weeks, you guys probably don't know what I'm talking about. How many of you have done revision? Right, by the general consensus, I'd figure uh, I'm at least happy you took Bain Hasmanim very seriously and you didn't do a stitch of work and you lived up to the, uh, the break. So I'm happy about that. James? Yeah? I didn't hear yeah. anything you said there because the whole thing went dead while you were Yeah, it broke up, yeah. yeah. It broke up. I didn't hear what you said. I just went, and that was it. And you said, I'm glad you guys didn't do a stitch of work. We didn't hear what you said. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So guys, come. Let's go seriously into it now. Um, so we're talking of a case. Uh, can anybody give me a one-minute revision of what we've done before the carpenter? Go on. <laughs> Before the carpenter, or about the carpenter? Not J.C. Penny, not the original. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I wasn't sure. Okay. You must know so, that. Who knows so who were, carpenter? He was allergic okay. to wooden nails. Uh, yeah, what can I say? Especially in his hands and his feet. Uh, okay, so the, the, two, the, the two things with the carpenter. The one, uh, the one situation was, uh, the one thing we discussed was uh, uh, a person comes into his premises, and he's given permission to come to his premises and something happens. Okay, I'm just giving a summary of what happened. And the second case was the the guy that were and and, and in that case the guy didn't go to uh, exile. Okay. Uh, in the other case, I think this is right, in the other case he had an employee that was working there, told the employee to leave, and the employee didn't the employee got killed. But um, because he told the employee to, look, he didn't think the employee was there, he's allowed to go to exile. Was the other way around. I'm not quite sure if I got it mixed. Right. Okay. Just I, I tell you what, we're not going to rehash everything. What we just want to remember is that there was a carpenter and a shopkeeper, and there was a case of permission granted and permission non granted yeah. in degree of liability. Okay. It goes through Rava, Rav Yossi Balchanina, Rav Papa's explanation of Rava, and a myriad of examples. I've got the cat at the shear now. I don't know if the cat is oh, no, a or a reincarnation of. Uh, of what, but it's, it's, it's here, believe me. I don't know, how do you see it, Arthur? It's not in the camera. I keep seeing its tail and it's here. I actually thought it was my cat. I looked behind me just now, I realized my door's closed. My cat's not in. All right. So, uh, all right, guys, Damon, let me just, yeah. When it comes around again, you can you just, you learn pure cat of what with it. Pure cat of what, exactly. All right. <laughs> so, so guys, all right, what we're talking about now is a third version. We're talking about a case of exile. We were originally talking in this stuff about domains. You have two different mm. domain issues where this comes up. So you have an issue of permissions and you have an issue of domains. But Stephen, that's the main thing that we're dealing with. There's a different degree of permission that you need if it's your own domain to grant some of the access compared to if it's a public domain where the default position is you have to be super careful because other people have permission to be there. So in this particular case, there's a third version cited. So that version cited um, of Rav Yossi uh, Bar, uh, Bar is by uh, Rav Zavid. And Rav Zavid said in the name of Rava. Okay, he said, listen, this is the third particular version. And this is, this is what it seems to be going through. I'll just push the cat off. Um, so it says, hang on a second. This third version is talking about a case when somebody throws a projectile, throws a stone, okay? And in that case, some um, special human being sticks his head out in the way and says, how is it? And it clonks him in the head and he goes to the next world. So the question is, what happens with this person that hurled the stone? Is he liable to exile or uh, not? He released the stone. Uh, so what do you guys think before we get some commentary? So if he's, if, Stone. If he's, so go ahead, somebody, go ahead. No, I, I, I don't think he's allowed to go to exile because he was actually being negligent by throwing the stone straight away. So it's negligent. It's not a, an accident. He threw it. He, he shouldn't be throwing stones because it can hurt. It can kill someone. 
Okay, but then by that virtue of that definition, he should go to exile. Uh, because the perfect yeah. case of exile is when it was accidental, but you were negligent, you knew other people, you, you, either your friend or somebody was in the public domain, or you know there was a possibility of somebody being in the public domain. So therefore, in that case, you go to exile. So is that a case where you should go to exile but, for this or not? Well, and the why? thing is, uh, well... I'm trying to figure out that myself, but I, I, I'm thinking my rationale is, yeah, he'll, he can go to exile if he's going to escape from something, but is he going there for, also for atonement as well? That's why you also go for to the to exile, because it's a, it's a form of suffering. For okay. In your so you, so you could. I mean, you could. I'm just. I haven't studied this, this like you have, so I'm just guessing. All right, and what does Stephen, Gavin, and Kevin think? What is uh, then? So, Stephen, what, what do you think? If you throw a stone and somebody pops their head in and says, hi, you, Stephen, and it tongs them yes. on the head and they end up uh, going to the next world because they're dead, are you liable for exile or not, do you think? And, and why? Just uh, yes. I would say yes. Negligence, like Arthur said. It's shocking. You checked, yeah. Okay, so you say he's liable to exile because he's negligent. Arthur's saying 100%. he's negligent and therefore he's not liable to exile. Have I understood you both correctly? Yeah. Oh, okay. I so. Great. And what does Kevin and Gavin say? It's a combination what? of both. It what can be. Think? Well, it's Bashoge. He didn't intend to kill the guy. Okay. Um, so that could be Bashoge, which, which, which would make him eligible for the Ire Miklat. But on the other hand, he could have been negative. You don't throw a stone, you don't do that. Don't behave like that because there's always a risk of someone getting uh, seriously injured. It could go either way. Okay, so I want to clarify something for you, Kev. Is that you? There's two concepts you're slightly mixing up, and that is a case of uh, uh, negligence versus exile. The whole reason you go to exile is because you were negligent, but it wasn't on purpose. Meaning that if it was murder where you just uh, hit somebody and they died, for example, as opposed to an accidental killing, that particular thing, one gets the death penalty. In a case where we, you, were, you killed the person, but there was no intent, but there was gross negligence that makes a person eligible for the city of refuge, uh, to, to go to exile to the city of refuge. So therefore, negligence implies the city of refuge because oh, okay. the family yes. then would have a right to kill you because you were negligent a family doesn't have a right to kill you if you were absolutely if it was an unavoidable accident just listen carefully guys if it's an unavoidable accident the canon the family cannot seek vengeance it's an unavoidable accident if it's on purpose the a person gets the death penalty if it's accidental, but there's gross negligence, meaning it's bordering on the intentional because they should have not been that negligent, then they get sent to the city of uh, refuge and are exiled, A, to protect themselves. Why are they protected against the family? Because they never meant to do it, but they deserve a life of being uh, exiled because they were grossly negligent. That's the best definition I can think of to tell you. Gavin, what is your opinion? Okay, so my opinion is that um, if a guy sticks his head out, if this guy looked around the whole area and there was no one in sight, and he, what did he throw stones, right? And he yes. throws a stone, and this guy puts his head out, then to me that's not gross negligence. It's, it's, an, it's an accidental uh, mishap. Okay, okay. Then, then he's not entitled to, he doesn't need to go to the city of refuge, because the family can't come after him and he doesn't need the kapura. It was a complete accident. Okay, good. Be... Um, uh, this, is, this is a discussion amongst the Rishonim. Um, obviously, uh, Gavin has good company uh, with the rum bum, and uh, there are other opinions, but Gavin, your, yours is the opinion of the rum bum, which is how halakhically we generally rule. So, well done. So, all right, let's just, let, let me just go through uh, what this is about a sec. So what happens is when Rav Zavid teaches in the name of Rava, Rav Yossi's statement, 
as having been said according to this following Bryce. The expression, and it finds, excludes a case where the victim is one who makes himself bound. In other words, one who moves himself in the path of the projectile after it has been released of the th uh, thrower. So what does this mean? In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19, verse 5, it states that the woodchop in the forest is liable where the axe head, or the woodchop, for example, finds his fellow who dies. So what does it mean, finds his fellow who dies? It means that there's somebody there uh, where the person is A, aware that they're there, or B, that the person is not suddenly appearing in the way. Does that make sense? It finds its fellow. It doesn't mean that the person put themselves in harm's way. We have to distinguish a case where a person uh, does something dangerous near his fellow compared to somebody who uh, suddenly springs upon a dangerous situation like uh, jumping in the middle of a racetrack of Formula One cars. They're two very different things. Okay, so the expression finds his fellow means that in this case, the person that was chopping the wood wasn't careful where the chip of wood or the axe handle found this fellow Jew and clipped him and killed him. In the other case, the person sticks his head in the way uh, and you're not expecting anybody into the path of the projectile. So that's why it says it excludes a case of one who makes himself far. So based on this, Rav Eliezer ben Yaakov said, if one releases a stone and the one, the victim stuck out his head and intercepted it and was killed, the thrower is not liable to exile since the scriptural requirement of and it finds, meaning the projectile finds the victim has not been met. Is that understood by everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it was with regards to this Bryce that Rav Yossi Barchanina said he is not liable to exile, but he would be liable to pay for four things if his victim was injured rather than killed by a stone. So in other words, we have here not liable to exile, but why would he be liable to pay for four things uh, if his victim was injured? rather than killed by a stone. Because if it's an unavoidable accident, like according to the Rambam's opinion, you don't pay uh, for those four things. In fact, there's a discussion as to whether or not you pay for actual body damage or not, which we're gonna go through. Uh, but um, the four things, certainly not. So why in this case, according to uh, that particular opinion, um, do, would you have to pay for the, uh, four things according to Rav Eliezer ben Yaakov. Why do you think, guys? Yes, in other words, guys not exiled. The stone thrower is not yeah. exiled. But the stone thrower yeah. now has to pay for the four things. So Stephen, the four things is as follows. If I hit a person, I am liable yes. to pay for um, number one, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm liable to pay for uh, actual mm -hmm. lesic shalem, full damages. Then I'm also liable to pay for pain, sorry, medical mm -hmm. experience, uh, mm -hmm. uh, expenses, which is refuah, mm -hmm. for shevet, which is uh, convalescing, in other words, recovery, and what the person's recovery time would be and what they would have earned in their new capacity at their new job in the time it's recovering. And then humiliation, if you hit somebody on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, embarrassment, but only if you hit somebody on purpose. So mm -hmm. the humiliation part you wouldn't pay, the fifth thing you wouldn't, but these four things mm -hmm. you pay excluding humiliation. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. If you're not at fault at all, according to what Gavin says, and it's an unavoidable accident, which the Rambam would agree, why would you pay, and, and you're not exiled, uh, because it's an unavoidable accident, why would you pay for these four things? Anybody got any thoughts? Um, because you have to do some form of atonement. Okay, but if you're not to blame, uh, why would you? Yes. Well, if you can't go to exile... No, 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 uh, what I'm saying is... You're saying, you're, you're saying you're 100% you're not to blame. It's not your fault. It no, was I'm, just I'm, the... saying, I'm saying if it's deemed an unavoidable accident, according to the Rambam, those are the words... Okay. 
that he uses in uh, Schottenstein, okay? According okay. to the Rambam who determines halacha, that's his opinion. It is an argument amongst the Rishonim with the tour, et cetera. There's a whole discussion in the riff okay. and the wrong. But the, the bottom line of it is, um, if it's deemed an unavoidable accident, and that's the reason why you're not exiled, because if it if you are negligent, you would go to exile. Just like in the case of the so why would you in this case pay for those four things? So I would think, you know, take a take a stab at it. Uh well I'm I'm on the run bum side, so I'm very reluctant to pay anything. But if this what's his name, Rabbi Eliezer, so maybe his thinking is that um, I I think if someone if there's a, because of the fact that it's still a public area, he's in a public area, and if you're in a public area, um, you have to take some sort of responsibility, you know, even though the guy stuck his head out. So, because it's risky in a public area to throw a stone, even if no one's around. Okay, so, so based that, on, on your question, there's two ways that. Uh, exile uh, is, uh, is is explained in Deuteronomy, okay? The first interpretation is that, uh, as you know, that the reason why you're negligent is you're not allowed to do a dangerous activity in the public domain. So since you're not the only one that has permission to be there, the default position is you've got to check if somebody was there before you do something dangerous, which is why in the case of the carpenter and the client, you have to, the, the carpenter has to check that the client isn't there. And therefore, any case in a public domain uh, where you're chopping wood, whether you know the person is there or not, but there's the potential for somebody to be there, that's gross negligence and you're eligible for exile. So according to your reasoning, then you would be exiled if you killed the person. Uh, I'm, I'm on the run side, but I'm no, trying no, to you, you haven't heard the floor of what you said. The flaw of what you said is as follows. Is no, no, just let, let me finish a sec. Is that you said you're not eligible for the four things because it's an unavoidable uh, uh, accident. Is that correct? No, what I reckon, so I've changed my mind now. So I reckon Rabbi Eliezer doesn't think it's, a, it's an unavoidable accident. Correct. Okay, but That's then why? why? So, so, so the Rambam, if we stick with the Rambam, he says it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an avoidable unavoidable accident, then he's entitled to say you don't pay anything. You Correct. Don't pay you. So he's entitled, and, and you don't get the city of refuge. So Correct. In this Correct. particular, Rabbi Elias doesn't agree with Rabbi. So okay. he's saying quite clearly, he's saying that, listen, it's a public domain, uh, you should have been more responsible, and and it is it, it is gross negligence. Okay, so you, we've got seven yeah. minutes left. Let, let's quickly go through this aspect. Correct, Gav. It's exactly so if you're going according to Rav Eliezer Ben Yaakov, you don't get exiled because it's not your fault. The person did stick his head out and he intercepted it. So he's also to blame. And since there is partial liability on the fault of the victim, you're not going to lose the rest of your life by going to exile. But there's still a bit of negligence on your part because in the public domain, the very fact that somebody could stick out their head and say hello means you're slightly liable for those four damages because if there was nobody there, how could he stick his head in the way and say hello? Mm. If you're truly throwing in a place where there's no one, how do you even be in the parameter where somebody could be? You never throw your head in the hidden bushes. If you throw your head, if you throw a stone in the desert and there's nobody around for two Ks, nobody's going to stick their head in the way and say hello. You'd see them coming which means you obviously threw the stone in a place that's relatively obscure and the potential was there. So therefore, because the person also put their head in harm's way, they also have to accept responsibility and that person isn't then liable to throw the rest of their life away because there is a part of it that's, uh, that is the victim's fault. So the family is not entitled to kill that person. So he doesn't have to seek refuge of exile, but he certainly has to pay for the four things if he created damage, because he was negligent in part, in part, because in, uh, because uh, he didn't even presume there could be anybody there. Are you with me? All right, so let's just go on quickly. So, um, 
The Gemara remarks regarding these different versions of Rav Yossi Bachan in a statement, the one who teaches it in regard to this price concerning the intercepted stone holds that it certainly applies in regard to the first price concerning the carpenter. Meaning very, very clearly, okay, if one who throws a stone is considered grossly negligent uh, and liable to pay for four things, even though he injured somebody whose presence he was never aware of, but he's not liable for exile because the victim also stuck his head in harm's way, then certainly the carpenter who was aware that his victim had entered the shop is considered much more negligent for not checking to see that he left and is definitely liable to pay for the four things in that regard. So for sure, if we learn that in the case of one who throws the stone and you hold him by that level, when it comes to the carpenter, for sure he's liable. That's what the price is saying. But the one who teaches it in regard to the first pricer, in other words, the carpenter, who said it only applies in that case, but in regard to this case of the price concerning the intercepted stone, the law would be that he is completely free of liability, even in the case of injury, he's not liable for the four things. So what he's saying is that the other opinion, there's two opinions. One is there's liability and one is there's not. The one that said there's not is saying the carpenter's case there is because he was aware of that person's presence. In this case, he's not, and he's not liable for the person, uh, he's not aware of the person's presence. So this is a dispute amongst the Rishonim. So whether the li whether there's liability even to pay Nezek Shalom, actual body damage. So the tour, um, and the, uh, the, the tour, just as a uh, matter of interest, was, um, uh, was around in about, when, when he was here around, he was in about 13, four, uh, 1269 to 1343. That's when the tour was around. So in that particular case, he's got a slightly different uh, uh, opinion in terms of liability. He said, you have to pay for uh, actual bodily damage, okay? But uh, because he, he, he says there is partial liability, you definitely have to pay for it, but you don't have to pay for the other, uh, uh, for, uh, the other three things, making it four in total. But uh, Rav Eliezer Ben Yaakov said, uh, who was earlier, that you have to pay for those four, four things because there's even more liability than the tour says. The Rambam on the other side says that the, uh, the scriptural verse and the stone or the axe handle has to find its victim, not the victim find the stone, etc., excludes any and all liability, even for actual uh, bodily damage. So the Bach says that the Rambam rules that way because he considers it an unavoidable accident. And the Choshana uh, Mishpat said that it's because uh, the Rambam sees, the Beis Yosef said it see, he doesn't see that it fulfills the scriptural verse of, and it finds the victim. The victim found the stone in this, this particular case. So you can see that there's different degrees of liability according to uh, who the uh, Rishonim hold by. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, uh, Arthur, how long have we got left? Because the cat's sitting on um, the ground. A minute fifty. All right, guys. Uh, I wish you Damon, before you go. Yeah. End of the day, there's still damages were incurred, but uh, the guy was killed. Uh... Yes, no, you're right. It's discerning between a case of death versus a case of. Uh, maiming or uh, uh, liability. Oh, okay. And we're always oh. going to rule more leniently on a case of death penalty or permanent exile, whereas in a case of bodily damage, we're more harsh to the perpetrator, often. You know, because uh, there's one thing paying money, <clears throat> another thing having the rest of your life written off. Uh, yeah. you, know, you know, so it's judged much more strictly when it comes to damages, as Arthur said. He brought up a good point there. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. okay, Stephen. Thank you, thank you for Wish joining. You long life. Thank you. Sure. Long life,